Hello, my friends. Dr. Cliff Kelly here again, digital circuit writer at your service on Saturday, April 13, 2024. Um, it's not related to the topic I'm going to cover today, but <clears throat> my wife and I are watching a very significant event in the Middle East. You probably already uh, are aware of it. Uh, Iran launched after threatening Israel with a counterattack after they took out uh, a major center of theirs. Uh, a number of drones, a dozen or more drones, which are basically preliminary and no particular threat, but they've launched a number of cruise missiles, heavily armed, that are now flying toward Israel. All of that to say, if you want to know why I do what I do and how I do it, which is the topic today, the times are accelerated in their intensity and in their proximity to fulfillment of so many things in the last days that I find myself turning the volume up. So the topic today, notes on why I sometimes shout because he told me to, beloved. Now that's not a recommendation for everybody else. This is just me. I'm going to explain a little bit about that without being focused on myself. In fact, if anything, I'll be self-deprecatory today. Um, yeah, well, let me pray and let's get started. This is really an important study um, of why I'm so intense. I, <laughs> I think I've been called intense since I was six years old. You know, why are you so intense, Cliff? I think now I understand. Father, in the name of Jesus, you built us and created us with love and precision and purpose in mind. We are indeed wonderfully made and created in your image, but each of us for a different purpose and each of us with a different personality, not unlike the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all the same truth, but different because each of those uh, writers were different that you called. Father, I just ask in Jesus' name, this is, <laughs> they're all heavy duty stuff, but there's also always marvelous hope in them because you are the one who's uh, watching over us every day, every minute. Uh, Holy Spirit, please bless this and bring it forth as I ask every time. Let me flow in you and not in me, uh, please, for the sake of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, okay, notes on why I sometimes shout, because I'm convinced he told me to, and I fought him on this. I've mentioned this before for years, for years. I still kind of do every now and then. Lord, wouldn't it be nice to be nice? Er, anyway. Again, this is for me. I'm not making recommendations for all of us so much as trying to make sure you understand if you're listening to my teachings, why am I the way I am a little bit so that you can judge whether or not I'm uh, completely loco or I have something to say in a way that you just don't hear anymore in the church. The scripture for today is Isaiah 58.1, sharp, short, direct, in your face to the point as Isaiah tended to be. Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet and declare to my people their transgression and to the house of Jacob their sins. With an explanation point in almost every translation. Blessed be the reading of the word of the Lord. Key term, kind of sandwiched together. Cry aloud, spare not. I'm trying to decide whether to use my inside voice or my outside voice today, which is kind of the central theme that I'm going to talk about. This is taken from two Hebrew terms, the first of which is chara or chara, from the idea of accosting a person. What? That can't be Christian. You know, you're gentle, humble, quiet, sweet, patient. Shh. A lot of the time, and sometimes no, unless God made a mistake. And he put the wrong word here in his prophet's pen, then that's what it says. It is derived from the idea of accosting a person. That's pretty aggressive. To utter a loud sound or cry out, to call for help. That's a big part of this. To call for help, to declare by name, to preach fervently to pronounce, proclaim, or publish, and thereby make renown, to read aloud from a scroll or a book so that all can hear. I'll come back to that point. The second word is garon, 
to bring up from the back of the throat, way down deep in a loud voice. I think those of you who are vocal coaches or singers probably can relate to this more. You, you don't sing from here. It has to come from down in here and back here for full richness and volume. Ah, I lost my place again. Uh, to bring up from the back of the throat in a loud voice implies a hostile force dragging people away. <laughs> Look, I, I would dare not, especially with God listening, make these definitions up. I go to the Hebrew, I go to the Latin, I go to the Greek, sometimes I go to the language of heaven, Spanish. In effect, what the prophet is saying, shout in a loud voice the iniquity of my people and do so without restraint. That's the word of the Lord, boys and girls. I don't know what else to do with that except present it to you. In part, introduction of explanation why I do what I do and I am the way I am. There'll be more about that a little later. Quotation. This is from Winston Churchill. He's uh, reflecting in his memoirs of the Second World War published in 1948. I love the quote and it has massive and wide application to what we're talking about these days. Here's what he said. Woe betide the leaders now perched on their dizzy pinnacles of triumph if they cast away at the conference table what the soldiers had won on a hundred blood-soaked battlefields. When he met with Roosevelt and uh, Stalin and basically divided up Europe in some terrible ways. What does that have to do with what we're talking about now? If we look back, whether or not you've read Fox Book and Art Martyrs or the, the uh, history of the Christian church, we dare not, we dare not throw away what 2,000 years of blood and sacrifice has earned for us in this supposedly freest nation on the place of the earth. We dare not. Commentary from, did I put it? Give me a minute, sometimes I forget. Gosh, I did, I have to go back and get that for you. Okay, it may be Joseph Benson again, forgive me. I'll read the commentary and then I'll correct it before I uh, publish the text. The commentary is cry aloud with an explanation point. Here's what it means. Be faithful, plain, and earnest in thy addresses. God loves, I've said it so many times, honesty and sincerity of just trying to do your best to tell the truth. He loves that, even if it's all stumbly and mumbly, as I often can be. Remonstrances, reproofs, and exhortations to among my people, no matter what you're doing, no matter what your purpose of speech is. Be honest, be faithful to the canon, the text, and spare not. Now this is the part, I don't think the prophet is saying do this in every case, but when you're in a crisis, when the Christian or Jewish community is in crisis, as Israel is right now, it's not the time to go mincing around, shh, oh, let's not raise our voice, let's not do anything strong, let's not be aggressive, let's not, no! The analogy is one for one, isomorphic, a term that I use every now to now and then to show off. I'm not going to tell you what it means. And spare not, forbear not to speak whatsoever I command thee for their conviction and reformation to speak. Jeremiah 1.17, scripture given to me when I was about one minute old in the Lord in 1979 or 80. I'm going to send you out and you're going to talk for me. And if you don't tell them what I say directly, I will embarrass and humiliate you right in front of your audiences. Does that sound like the Jesus you hear about every day and every Sunday in church? That's part of him. Jesus is a serious, I was going to say serious dude with a capital D. He's a lion now. Not the lamb anymore, although that can be theologically debated. He's the Lion of Judah. The Lion of Judah. Remember that. That's the one that's coming back. Be not afraid. I'll come back to that very important point. Pastors, church, Christians, stop being afraid. Because you are. I'm going to give you empirical proof of that in a minute. 
you're afraid. I'm going to tell you what you're afraid of. Be not afraid to exert thy voice and spend thy strength in this work. Give an alarm which all, all may hear. Show my people, another mistake, show my people their transgressions. Tell them their sins. We don't hear that hardly at all anymore. Well, you know, Jesus is just, he's here to comfort and save and mend and, and, and heal and provide and, you know, and he is. But he's also insistent every day if you're continuing, as I do in some areas, in a sin that you struggle with, all he wants to know is two things. Will you admit it to him? And number two, will you ask for his help? It may take years, but as long as you're contrite in that way, he will be with you. We're not calling for perfection here. Honesty. Show my people their transgressions, Pastor. Tell them. And tell them of the dangers out there. Set their sins, all their sins, before them in a true point of view and with all their aggravations, especially the iniquities of their holy things and the hypocrisy of their religious services. And I see it everywhere, as do some of you. Isaiah 58, 2 says it directly, that they may brought to true repentance for them. God's not out to just punish to hurt you or me and spank you and, you know, discipline you and make you sad or make you uh, experience some pain just because he wants to. He wants to save you, just like a parent who sees a child going off in a terrible direction, whether it's a toddler running across the street or a teenager taking drugs. You, you, you can't just, well, there's an old word, I'm not even sure it's right, mollycoddle at such times. You just can't. And that's what the church, full of mollycoddle, whatever, I have to look that up. I haven't used that in centuries. I make the comment here, when the Lord first started calling me to this whole circuit ride thing, I don't know if you can see it right over here. See that painting up there? A precious friend of mine named Ari, a Hispanic barista that I go see uh, on a weekly basis, her and her crew. She's an artist, and she painted me that picture uh, of, of an old circuit rider on a snowy day looking probably west or east, I'm not sure, a Bible in his hand, um, going on a circuit ride. When God started calling me to this stuff in 2016, it started like a little, little tiny, little tiny seed that didn't even know what it meant when I started getting this idea of circuit riding. Uh, back in 2016, I, I argued with him about why he would choose. This is, listen to me. I can, I can smell a fake contrition 70 miles off in the dark in a storm. This is the truth of me, beloved. Again, he's over my shoulder. He's watching me and listening to me. I argued with him why he would choose such a wretched sinner like me. I ain't going to tell you the details, but I'm saying I came from wretchedness. He got me better in some of the biggest ways, but I still have wretchedness in me, and so do you. Even Paul said that. I think it's in the seventh. No, I don't remember the chapter. Uh, 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 perhaps in Romans, sorry, I'm, I'm not sure, but he said, oh, wretched man that I am, why in effect, Christ, would you choose me? I'm there. I'm there every day. I still, I still shake my head. Um, but he did. I remember I asked him for months and months out here in the yard where I take smoke, uh, Smokey, that's my other dog, uh, in the past days, I scout the wonder dog, can't see him, uh, out to do his business. Months and months, I'd be there, Lord, why me? Yeah, I'm a good teacher. You gave me a skill for teaching, but gosh, you know the rest of it. Why me? No, I'm not raping and pillaging and drinking and uh, not, not the big stuff. But, you know, even the middle to little stuff will get you in trouble. I remember finally, finally, I didn't hear a thing for months and months and months. With God as my witness, I don't mean this is a boast. This is what I heard and it could have been wrong. I could be inaccurate here. Finally, he spoke and it was clear. I heard it, not vocally, but in my spirit because no one else would do this. Now, what, Dr. Kelly, you pompous poop. There's plenty of voices out there. Yeah, there are a few. I think particularly of my beloved brother Paul, James Key, Russell Moore, Beth Moore, and a small handful of others that I know of and more are coming to the attention of all of us. I guess... 
what I reflected on later was that I would be the only one who would do it like this. Paul, Brother Paul, we don't know who he is, where he lives. He's a smart guy. On his YouTube channel. If he's not, if he doesn't have a past that's <clears throat> a five-star investigative journalist, I'd be surprised. This guy, a television journalist, there's nobody better than him. It's kind of, he gives you kind of like a, a Christian 60 minutes. I mean, it's superb, professionally, biblically sound. Um, even his voice and demeanor is steady. He doesn't get upset like I do. He's just, he's got a wonderful sense of humor, a great sense of humility. That's his, that's his way. Uh, James Key reminds me of kind of a, a friendly kind of Bible study uh, leader that you see in a, in a group of people uh, teaching on Antichrist. And last time he does it very well. He brings news reports, but his is a very gentle way. Uh, whereas uh, Paul is a sort of a direct but, but moderate voice. Then there's me. Why do I do what I do by heritage, I've said this before, I'm a Hispanic, Jewish, and Scottish, whatever, combination of things. I may be making too much of biology here, but I think I'm given to a rather passionate temperament that you see on display. Been that way before I was a Christian, been that way after I'm a Christian, and I will have to confess that in the last five to seven years, that intensity and that loudness has increased as I watch what I see happening every day, rightly or wrongly. I mentioned last time that one of the three names he gave me over the centuries I've been on the earth is Bonerges, which means son, sons of thunder or commotion. Um, and he didn't, when he called James and John with that label, he wasn't, you know, we can debate the point, he wasn't criticizing, he was describing. This is the way I built you guys. I built. Peter this way, and I built Paul that way, and I built John that way, and I built Mark and Matthew and all the rest in a different way. And each one would come forth with the truth in a different way, but not bending or distorting the truth. Yeah, this may sound like an apologia, a big apology, but I just want you to understand, I'm not going off half-cocked most of the time without really thinking this stuff through and thinking about it and praying about it and writing about it. I want you to know what you're getting. Caveat emptor. You don't have to like or even watch this channel or read my stuff on Facebook or anywhere else. But I want you to know what you're getting. To clarify, I went directly to uh, James Strong's 1890 Bible Concordance that most people use, who notes this about those sons of commotion. Their passion and boldness in the past no doubt aptly fit their future calling. I don't know why God made me this way. I do remember I've seen pictures of me uh, when I was two years old. People come up to me and say, ah, what a cute little boy. I do this. I put up my dukes. I've got pictures of it. I also used to have blonde hair when I was a kid, so I don't know. Uh, I may be from another planet. And my nickname was back then Punchy. So it's ready to engage. It doesn't mean courage. It just means God planted in me some kind of strange algorithm that gives me to passion. And that passion can be used for better or for worse. Don't we all know that? The point Strong was making, I think I, I, I've already addressed, so I'm not going to go back to it. But I wanted to emphasize what my calling is for those of you who have thankfully got a number of new people coming in to the YouTube channel especially. I thank God for you. Uh, we've still got uh, a large number, a majority of Christians who are doing everything they can to follow Christ, to actually follow him, who cannot go with the Trump train. Uh, we've got some uh, non-believers who come in and say some very gracious things. Got some non-believers who come in and say some very ungracious things. Uh, and I will listen to them if they stay re reasonably civil. But if they go on the attack dog thing, I just bounce them. So, if you want me to listen to you, approach me appropriately, strongly, firmly, that's fine. But I'm just a human being. It is not for everyone now, this calling of mine. 
which is to warn God's people of their grave errors. I promise you before the court of heaven, I have never even had a, a twinkle in my eye or my mind about that as a calling for me. I knew I was going to be a teacher a long time ago in a place far, far away, but never this. This is why I battled him for the first couple of years, at least, and why I was called to this. Um, to warn his people of their grave errors. He, of course, knew that the grave errors would explode. By the way, you can read about it in the New Testament a lot and in the Old that in the last days, I'm going to quote some scriptures about that, these kinds of things would explode on the scene. So this isn't for everyone, but it is for me. So I'm just trying to be faithful to my calling. Best I can. Mistakes and all. Second, an era of false teachers. I just mentioned that by introduction. If there was ever a need for people to focus on false teaching, wouldn't you logically conclude that it would be in an age of false teachers? Doesn't that make sense? Logical sense as well as theological. And I go on to say that perhaps the most serious sin a Christian pastor or teacher or leader can commit is to preach false doctrine. And beloved, it is everywhere. It is just like Jesus said it would be. Just like Paul and the apostles said it would be. How about that? I have before written a great deal about how much God hates lying. Puppies in the yard, puppies in the yard. <laughs> the scout's doing his, his uh, Rhodesian Ridgeback best to protect the homestead. Hey, 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 buddy. Come on, come here. It's, we're all safe. <laughs> He'll go on for a minute. Um, God hates lying. I already read the passage and did a teaching on Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. Three of those seven were about lying, deceiving. Uh, I mean, we don't hear that enough. He hates lying. Now, here's where I get in trouble. If you do it enough, I don't care if you're a Christian or not, if you do it long enough and sustain it and persevere in it and prosecute it and keep going at it and going at it and you happen to be a leader or a pastor, he will come to regard you as his enemy and hate you if you don't listen to his correction. That's another part of the gospel you don't hear. I'm not making it up. Christ's severe warning, for example. <clears throat> From Matthew 7, taking my time. 7, 15 through 20 in the New King James. This is Jesus talking now. Forget me. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every, listen to me. No, listen to Jesus, your king. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Do you know what the fire is? It's not your backyard compost pile. And thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them and regard them accordingly whatever they call themselves. I believe that more I believe that more today than at any other time in my life. What is that? That this saying that most of us grew up with if we're if we're Christians. You will be surprised on that day of days who on that day of days who is received into heaven and who is cast into outer darkness. You're gonna be surprised. A lot of the big names, the hot shots the wealthy, the powerful, the, you know, famous. I don't think a number of them are going to make it. I'm not naming because I'm not God, but I'm saying I think a lot of them are in trouble. Let me finish that from Matthew 13. There are many who you will not expect to be cast into outer darkness and the furnace burning with a great fire where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth forever. Scriptures you don't hear preached anymore. Used to. Used to. Generations ago. Not anymore. 
My point, America's spiritual landscape, I believe, is darker than it's ever been in our history. And we've had some pretty dark times. So in spite of mountains of evidence of the current crisis of faith in our country, unbelievably breathlessly, I teach about it almost every time I go to the, to the computer, it seems to me that the church remains for all intents and purposes fully asleep at the switch of truth. It, it just, I mean, every Sunday and Wednesday or Friday, whenever they're telecasting their stuff around the country, I hear the same sermons as if nothing was going on outside. It'd be like a tornado coming if you live in Kansas. I'm going to go visit Kansas in June with a bunch of you. Be like being in Kansas and there's a, there's a, a, a class five tornado. I don't know if that's the right wording. And you can hear it roaring. You can see the debris flying. The windows are beginning to break. And you're just saying, no, it's all going to be fine. Don't worry about it. You're not even going to the basement. It's insane, beloved, what the church is doing or not doing. It's insane. And it's terribly bloody dangerous. So I go to uh, the point of this. So that's why I sometimes shout. I've been at this eight years now. I began by holding conversations with my old colleagues at Regent University back in Virginia, professors mostly of all Protestant and Catholic backgrounds, all scholars. And it started out amicably, uh, an, amic amicably enough, but I remember I saw a pattern in the first couple of months, and the pattern was defend Trump, defend Trump, defend Trump, defend Trump, defend Trump. Oh, he's this. One of my uh, understudies who ended up getting her PhD, brilliant woman, uh, from Catholic University in political theory. I won't mention her name. She used to argue with me. Well, yeah, we got to talking about Russia, and she just said, oh, well, you know, Putin's a Christian. We don't, you know, he prays, and he goes to church, and he talks about his mother. And, and I began to shake my head back then, 2016-ish. And I began to see my volume increasing. My intensity began to increase by 2020. It had increased considerably. I hadn't prayed about it very much by then, but I have since. Because it is pitched now, my outrage. And I try to control it, but I will not deny the outrage nor its cause. And we dare not do the same either. Depending on however the Lord has called you to confront it. So, I sometimes shout. Shouting, I note here, may or may not involve actually raising my voice, as I frequently do, rightly or wrongly. It more fundamentally refers, refers to something that the Bible calls in the Greek, sharp rebuke. That's from Paul's writing. Sharp rebuke. A practice nearly vanished from the American church community in recent years. American Baptist theologian, pastor, and chancellor of Bethlehem College in Minnesota, John Piper, no, I don't agree with everything he writes, but I love a lot of this stuff, addresses this sensitive topic in an interview entitled, Should We Call Out False Teachers Today or Just Ignore Them? I know what the church is doing. They ain't doing no calling out at all. And it's overwhelmingly ignoring them. I guess it's just not polite to, you know, call out one of the guys in the club. I'm just going to do a brief bullet point review of his main points. A lot of scripture. That's why I like John Piper. Uh, beware of the wolves! Exclamation point. And he, like I did just a moment ago, so let's begin with Jesus. He writes, Matthew 7, 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And he goes on to say, Beware, the word beware in the Greek means all of us stay on alert. There is no time out. There's no time to get drunk. There's no time to just take a one-month cruise around the world and forget Jesus altogether. There's no time for that. By the way, the cruise lines, are, apparently their business are just plummeting right now for all kinds of reasons. That's the last thing I'd want to do is go on a cruise for two weeks in the midst of all this as a Christian, not out of fear, just out of duty. 
Seriously? 10,000 bucks, two weeks off? I don't see a lot of that in the New Testament of the, of the boys. Do you? Beware means all of us should be constantly on alert, but especially you shepherds to identify. I, I remember a time when the shepherds would go up to a retreat for three days and nights, take nothing but their Bible, a notepad, maybe some music, but and they just shut themselves in. Why? To have fun and relax? No. To hear the voice of Almighty God, just like when Moses went up on Sinai. That's what you go away for, Pastor. Yeah, you can recharge your batteries that way too, but you recharge them in Christ, not on a cruise. Just my opinion. It's not biblical. It's just my opinion. It infuriates me that Christians are just spending tens of thousands of dollars on having fun while the world's, while the world's about to be set on fire. What the blank are you guys thinking of? Seriously. Well, I'm an American. Make a good salary. It's okay. I deserve it. He goes on, they're clothing themselves in lamb's wool. Well, they're wolves. Paul used the same Greek word for beware in Acts 20 when he said, pay careful attention to yourselves, pastor, and to all your flock. You're to protect them. With what? With the truth. With the truth. Nothing but the truth. So help you God. Not just the truth that they've already heard 80 million times that'll, you know, just go down like syrup challenge them with truth that will save them from the danger that is now around us and yet to come thousands of times more critically he quotes Acts 20 pay a careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseer <clears throat> I know that after my departure Paul wrote Fierce wolves will come in and among you, not sparing the flock. So you should not spare the warning, beloved. Please hear me. Please hear Paul. Please hear Messiah. Listen to them. Second point, avoid and call out. Now, he says, he writes, to avoid them, you have to know who they are. Well, we can't know who they are unless you identify them. Paul and the apostles use names. I'm beginning to a little bit more. I'm a little tremulous about that. I better be doggone well sure I know what I'm talking about and can document the error. You can't avoid somebody if you don't know who they are. This idea of identifying and avoiding shows up in 1 Corinthians 5, 2 Thessalonians 3, 2 Timothy 3, 2 John 1. He goes on and it's there, but nobody's teaching on it except this old bird. In other words, Christians and shepherds in particular should be discerning and alert to behavior and teaching that dishonors Christ. Oh, my dearest father. You watching the news? What Christians are doing and saying and preaching and teaching and ignoring? You watching? Oh, no, I just live in my little Christian bubble and just live a peaceful life. And then in 1 Timothy 5, 19, 20, Paul went beyond just avoiding them. And he start, started talking about rebuking them. Not just rebuking them. Publicly, like I'm doing. Publicly. I've had, in the last four, three, four years with my former church that I've totally walked away from. I don't know how many times I volunteered. I wrote them in a more moderate tone. Listen, I've got a book. I've got this. I've got, I'll give you everything I've learned in the last five years. I'll give it to you for free. All you have to do is buy me a cup of coffee. And you feel, if you feel real generous, give me a pastry. No answers, no answers, no answers. No, I got one a couple of years back. I can't engage with you. You're too negative. And finally, I, I told you before, I offered all three, four major pastors. All I'm pretty sure I'm making, they're making six figures. I'll offer them free copies of my book. No strings attached, just here. Didn't even get an answer for two weeks. And then I wrote back the pastor that I had addressed. And I, I leveled him. As Paul would have. As Jesus would have. I leveled him. And said, I'm shaking the dust from my feet. 
after years of trying with you, I'm done. I'm done with your church. I'm done with you and your big house and your big ranch and all the rest of it. And if you see me in public, walk away. It wasn't a threat. I just, I don't want to engage. I'm done with him. That's what Jesus taught. That's what he taught. Now, I'm not talking about family members that God has called you to pray for almost ad infinitum, but in a general way. There comes a point with me where I cut all ties. That's what my Lord told me to do. And not waste my time with them anymore and go to the ones who will listen. So Paul writes in that passage, do not admit a charge against an elder on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, sin of false doctrine, evil behavior, or anyone who does not accept correction, here's what Paul commanded in the authority of Jesus. Rebuke them in the presence of all. Why? So that the rest may stand in fear. Fear of who? Fear of Jesus Christ. Our last day's charge. And arguably, I believe this is what the Lord commands the shepherds especially to do, but all of us in our small way. When they find false teachers and false doctrines infiltrating the church, church and they're everywhere. They're leading the church. They're leading the charge for Donald Trump's Christian nationalism movement. Whole, whole lot of them were there on January 6, 2021 in Washington. I knew some of them. I could tell you stories about what's happened to them since. It's not good. It's not good. You don't fool around with God's name by participating in something like that. He's loving and he's just all the time. So then, if this is clear to you as it is to me, why all the silence? Why all the silence? I'm going to hurry up a little bit on the last section it's going to be very rough ride if you're a pastor or a teacher or a leader an elder in a church that's compromising or staying quiet c.s lewis and i've quoted it a number of times because it's i love lewis's directness as well as his brilliance and and uh, and eloquence he wrote this in the abolition of man 1943 it's about the third time i've quoted it directly he wrote this, in a sort of ghastly simplicity, we remove the organ and demand the function. We make men without chests. That's my wife's favorite phrase for these matters. We make men without chests and expect of them virtue and enterprise. We laugh at honor and are shocked to find traitors in our midst. We castrate and bid the geldings go and be fruitful. C.S. Lewis. Abolition of Man, 1943. Now, in fairness, he was talking probably more generally about the decline of Western culture, but I immediately took it to mean, in the case of the American church, exactly what we have in our pulpits today. Pastor, if that insults you, take it to God. Take it to Him. Is that a description of you? Is that who you are? Got trained in seminary to just go back and be nice? I have a note here, though Lewis was referring to here more generally, I wonder, he, he would probably be astonished to see what's going on today. And then I had a wry smile on my face and I wrote, or would he? I think he knew it was coming. I fully realize I'm hard on pastors. The reasons are many. And it started with me in earnest back in 2014 when George Barna came out with that stunning report. I think it was in August July, August 2014, in his always excellent and thoroughly researched analysis of church leadership. Sam Rohrer, president of the American Pastors Network website and online journal, summarized what Barna found back then. This is the second or third time I've presented this in the past three years, but it bears repeating to establish my point. Here's what he summarized the findings were. New research shows from Barna that while 90% of pastors believe the Bible in 2014 has much to say about today's pressing political and societal issues, less than 10% are talking about those issues from the pulpit. Further, 
When we asked them, Barna said, about all the key issues of the day, 90% of them are telling us, yes, I keep aware the Bible speaks to every one of those issues and Barna, that Barna told in this interview on American Family Radio, Radio. And then, he, then we asked them, well, are you teaching your people about what those critical issues are and what the Bible says about them? And the numbers plummeted to less than 10%. No, no. That 10% is an interesting number, isn't it? Remnant, come to mind, does for me. Barna added, the crux of the matter, they're afraid. Pastors, you're afraid. You're, op you're operating in fear, not fear of God by any stretch. Dr. Barna said that many pastors are afraid to get involved in political issues because by their own confession of the controversy that it might create. And he added, they said, controversy keeps people from being in the seats. Controversy keeps people from giving money and attending programs. He also found that when asked how they measure the success of their churches, five factors were mentioned, none of which are biblical. One, Attendance, two, giving, three, number of programs, four, number of staff, five, square footage. It's the most disgusting report I've ever read, hands down, about the American church. That was in 2014. Have things improved then or degraded since then? Jimmy Dodd, in a, in a sort of ancillary support of that whole idea, pastor, CEO, and founder of something called Pastor Serve. He serves and works with pastors tries to help rehabilitate them if they're all burnt out and beat up. <laughs> sure, I'm sure I'm not helping them any. He writes, Wesley Horn, pastor serves Southeast Regional Director and I were recently at a small gathering. I think this was back around 2019. Didn't have the article dated. The leader of the discussion, oh, gathering of pastors and leaders from around the country. The leader of the discussion turned to me and said, Jimmy, in a nutshell, what is the number one problem plaguing pastors in America? In a nutshell, after shooting up a quick prayer, I knew Wesley was doing the same. I said in one word, fear. Two independent sources, one rather anecdotal, one thoroughly researched, same conclusion, years apart. Fear, but not fear of God, fear of man. A particular man that I'll end with today. He finishes his statement. I'll skip over most of it. Fear drives us to do crazy things like support the seditious, blasphemous Christian nationalist movement of what I believe to be led by the Antichrist of the Bible, Donald Trump. Fear has done that, and it will do it again November 5th. And I hope to Jesus I'm wrong. I just hope I'm wrong. And then I'll have to re configure everything, withdraw copies of my book from the shelves. I put it all on the line, beloved, in so many ways. That sounds like a boast. Maybe it was. I, You know, I just, uh, who was it? I just read yesterday. Oh, oh, my beloved young pastor in a sermon. I don't know if it's last Sunday. At the end of it, he had the beginning of tears in his eyes. He's been going through some really tough times. He teaches the truth. He's a young man, probably mid-30s. And uh, I'm not sure the exact wording, but he just said, I'm so tired of pretending. I'm so tired of playing church. I'm just done with it. Beloved, I want everybody who's listening to me and reading me to come to exactly that same place because I promise you the most exciting life you will ever live starts right there. Right there. Aaron Earls, my last example, I think, next to the last writing for Lifeway Church, summarized a report published on August 8, 2023 that opens her eyes a little further um, about the current decline of the American church and pastoral unwillingness to confront the mountainous crisis of our times over truth and morality in America. He, did I cite this one? <laughs> Yeah, August 8th, 2023. Here's what he wrote. Fear not is a frequent command in the Bible, but most pastors feel churchgoers aren't getting the message if they're even preaching the message properly. 
A LifeWay research study finds that almost 7 out of 10 United States Protestant pastors, nearly 70%, believe there is a growing sense of fear within their congregations about the future of the nation and the future of the world. I almost said, duh. Girls then follows up with a breakdown of mainline versus evangelical. The point is, and he doesn't state it, so I will. How could they not fear what's going on if you're not telling them how to deal with the fear and where that fear comes from and what the Bible says to do to steady it, to tame it, and to put it under your own feet in the name of Christ, according to his teachings. But they're not. So everybody's running, running scared. Dr. Russell Moore, so I have time for this. Yeah, almost. I brought it before. A couple of snippets from his <coughs> courageous position. Echoes the same point. He writes, uh, this is from August 18th, 2023, in a interview summary by Nick Reynolds in... Uh, Newsweek. Here's what, uh, I'm sorry, here's what Dr. Moore said in this extrapolation of that point. My big fear is that we're at the point right now where it's not even a point of controversy for most people. He's talking about the election coming up in November. Let me say that again. My big fear is that we're at the point right now where it's not even a point of controversy. I just talked to somebody, two Christians again, one from Europe, one from America, yesterday in the coffee shop. Oh, oh, they went on and on and on about how they hated Biden and how they, ah, and that, the, you know, there was no, there was no contest for them to vote for Trump. The church is going to vote for him. He's in, unless God himself stops him. My big fear is that we're at the point right now where it's not even a point of controversy for most people, Christians, most people who would ordinarily argue about them, his morality and all the rest, have, have either made peace with it, yep, 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 they've excused it away, or have just stopped talking to people who will disagree with them, like me. There's one particular point that just shocks me. Every time I tell them that I stopped counting at over 70 death threats and why I carry a 9mm Smith & Wesson on my hip with an extra clip, they almost yawn. It's like that Star Wars movie. There's nothing to see here. You can let us pass. Every time, nobody said, Oh my goodness! Trump's people? Every time. Delusion is very thick in the air these days. Most people who ordinarily argue about this have made peace with it or just stopping talking to people who disagree with them. And that's one of the reasons why I really don't think 2024 is going to be a repeat of what we saw in 2016. Now you think he, he's going to say, oh, it's not going to happen. No, no. Listen to how he finishes. It's just numbness now. And I think that says something really bad about American life and church life too. It's as if the church just rolled over on its side and said, let it be. Let it be. I can hear John McCartney now. Or not John McCartney. Who's the guy? The Beatle. Just let it be. Just let it be. It's, it's going to be okay. Trump will take care of it. Multiple pastors tell me as he concludes, and as I've got to conclude, and I will, Multiple pastors tell me, Dr. Moore says, essentially the same story. This is, this is stunning. About quoting the Sermon on the Mount, parenthetically in their preaching. Turn the other cheek. You know, it's a Trump's terrible things. Turn the other cheek. And to have someone come up, and after, up after to say, where did you get those liberal talking points? Referring to the Sermon on the Mount. Liberal talking points. Moore asked during his interview at the time, he added, when the pastor would say, I'm literally quoting Jesus Christ, the response would be, listen to this. I've seen this. I've heard it. I've read it. Yes, but that doesn't work anymore. This turning the cheek stuff. That's weak. When we get to the point where the teachings of Jesus himself are seen as subversive to us, then we are in a crisis. I say, my beloved Dr. Moore, we're way beyond a crisis. We're on our way to hell.
So I conclude, no, we can't fix it by an election. No, we can't fix it through the church. Pastors are all in fear. Not all, but you know, vast majority, 80% or more. I think it's more. No pun intended. We are left with Christ alone to fix this, but I don't think he's going to fix it. I think there's a plan being carried out that we read about in the Law, the Prophets, the Apostles, and the Messiah himself. I think it's fixed now in place. I think it's fixed in place. So, what are we supposed to do? I'm going to be writing a lot about that in the future as the Lord lays it, rolls it out for me. Christ alone. We begin there individually to fill us with his hope, his wisdom, his courage, his perseverance, his provision, and his protection so that we can carry out our particular mission. That's what we're called to. Something about that in Matthew 28, 19, and 20? I don't know. I may be making it up. And may God secure our families and help us to reach out to our neighbors who are willing to listen. I won't waste my time on the belligerents. I just walk away. So did Christ. So did the apostles. And may we see the Lord solidify the last day's remnant. I pray for us every day. <coughs> us not meaning just our little gathering in the Peloton Fellowship. Again, my throat gets dry when I talk a lot. So may he solidify his last day's remnant around the world. Bring new names and new leaders, teachers, uh, uh, encouragers, uh, warriors, soldiers, foot soldiers, uh, ministers, uh, men and women who serve others in this common cause to stay true to Christ and to resist Antichrist in biblical ways. I would love to see the voices of modern days, modern day Wycliffe's and Luther's and Bonhoeffer's and Wilkerson's and Moore's and others come to the microphones and to the publications more and more and more till we're flooded with truth to counter all this darkness. To do this, again, as I probably will end every time now, to do it while it is still day, for night fast approaches, John 9, 4, when no man or woman or child can work anymore. Let's get on with it. Father, I thank you for helping me in this presentation. Another rough one. I've tried to justify and document and anchor it to your word as they relate to the times in which we engage. Bless this, all that was true, and eliminate, erase anything I said that was not true. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Love you guys. Uh, yeah, I'm going to start looking for God's tightening our understanding of what we do now uh, if, if Trump rises to power again. We're going to take some lessons from Nazi Germany, uh, from certain figures there who were at least for a time effective as Christians, as believers, and noble Gentiles who helped the Jews, noble atheists who will help Christians here. We're going to need each other. We're going to need each other. Love you. <laughs>